And now Nathan. So there's a lot of local people today, I just want to make that clear. As you know, people who've come to the Play Symposium before, I tend not to have locals, <coughs> just to bring outside voices in. And <coughs> how wonderful has it been to have so many locals speaking today, so I'm just smashing that up now. Yeah. <laughs> smashing that up. Um, Nathan. Hi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's back up. Is this a really handsome photo of everybody? I think the other side. <laughs> Especially today when we're, we're talking about, you know, innovation. I have been up here for two and a half days and I still can't do it. Like, oh, anyway. Nathan Harrison. He's a performer, he's a writer and he's a game maker. He works as a solo artist and as part of collectives Apple Spiel and Boho Interactive creating theatre and games about nature and social ecological systems. Now, he's a 2021 Griffin studio artist. What's that? I just had a residency. I didn't realise I left that in there. <laughs> Good. I was, I was like, oh, that's cool. I wrote a play. <laughs> Excellent. He's a radio broadcaster and a host of the podcast Hottest 100s and Thousands. Can I introduce you to Nathan? Thank you. Got to plug the pod, I guess. I didn't realise you'd be reading that out. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Nathan, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I grew up on Darawal land in the Illawarra. I now live and work on Bidjigal Gadigal land in South Sydney. Um, and it's been a real privilege to be here on Ngunnawal, Nambri land uh, for all of this week. I've been making things and connecting with people and having beautiful conversations and I love being on this country a whole lot. Uh, so I'd like to pay my respects to the land and to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I would like to apologise at the top. This slideshow is not going to be anywhere near as nice as Kier's. Um, not too much to apologise for the quality, but there's probably not as many words on there as there should be, and I know some people, it's very useful to have words on a slideshow. So I'm sorry for that. Um, feel free to grab me afterwards to ask questions or give disparaging comments if that's um, helpful. I'm going to talk about the work that um, Boho Interactive makes and I'm going to try and talk a little bit about our process and how that's changed over the last 10 years or so. Um, and then maybe I'm going to try and dive a little bit deeper into a particular game and talk through the steps and decisions we made to make that game. Um, yeah, so Boho Interactive is a, um, do I have a slide for this? We're also going to have a lot of black in the slideshow and that's, a lot of that will be the parts I thought about walking here this morning, but that's fine. Now, back we go. <laughs> Boho Interactive is a collective of artists, mostly with a theatre background, um, that work with scientists and other research and cultural institutions to make tabletop games about uh, complex systems, about social ecological systems, about things like research, um, and all sorts of things. Uh, our games are hands-on, tactile, analog, which is largely because we like having a physical experience around a table with someone, but also largely because we have no digital skills to speak of. Um, Boho started in about 2006, before I joined. It, it was originally Bohemian Productions. It was a theatre group doing a lot of Pinter plays. Um, and over time became more interested in uh, making their own work, became more interested in complexity and how to represent that in theatre, and more interested in interactivity and, and getting audiences to do things and sort of completing a narrative and conceptual image with the people that had come to the show. Um, uh, an early show that I wasn't part of, Food for the Great Hungers, no picture, um, was an alternate history of Australia using complexity to sort of look at different events and how they could have gone and things like that. In 2012, I joined Boho Interactive for a project that at the time was called Modelling Play. We were um, challenged by the Environment Institute of University College London to create an interactive performance about modelling, about complex systems and particularly about climate modelling. Uh, 2012, the conversation was a fair bit different about climate and particularly climate modelling. There was a lot more... Uh, antagonism maybe, um, around a lot of the terms and the conversations that were happening. 
And so they wanted us to make a show that could be put in front of people to help them understand those processes a little bit better and maybe to start a conversation where there wouldn't be one before. So particularly looking for a show that could go into spaces that were not usually up for talking about climate. They wanted us to take a whole lot of things um, and models and diagrams and things like this um, and turn it into something like this, which is what we did over a very long period of time. More models um, like this. We spent a while in residence at um, the Environment Institute. We hung out with a lot of climate scientists. We looked at their gleefully impenetrable models um, and tried to make sense of them. Um, and figure out how we could turn them into something that had story and had play and was engaging in any way um, for a normal person. Yeah, <laughs> they just get worse and worse. Um, we, maybe that's too far. So we spent, um, this slideshow is terrible. Where are the books? The book slide might be coming up later, but it might not. So I'm going to say, we also read two really great books called Resilience Thinking and Resilience Practice by Brian Walker and David Salt, uh, scientists from CSIRO right here in Canberra. Um, incredible books that became really foundational texts for our process. They were about how people can build pictures of social ecological systems. There were a lot of incredible case studies about different uh, events and interactions. There was a lot of uh, stories about working with communities, a process of um, participatory co-modeling to build a common picture of a system uh, working through iteratively. And it also had a number of prompts that, and questions that you could ask of a system to get a good picture of it. There was, I meant to put a slide in because this would this is classic slide material, but things like what's the scale of the system, who are the people, the governance of the system, what are the issues? I can tell you all that, like don't, you don't need to write it down, but um, what are the trade-offs in the system? What are the sort of disturbances that are expected and unexpected? What are the trends and drivers that are shaping the, the system and, and what might its future look like? Those prompts became our Bible in terms of how we started to describe systems and put them in a shape that we could look at them in terms of narrative and in terms of interactivity. Um, no, still no. All right. <laughs> So we did that for a while and we practiced, um, I thought I had a really nice slide here, we just, if you could imagine rooms covered like ceiling to floor in butcher's paper and just lists and charts and, and little versions of all those horrible diagrams I showed before. We made maps of river catchment areas, we made maps of small towns, of schools and hospitals, city blocks. We ended up then taking all that process and having a go of turning that into a game. And we made a little game about a beachside town called Bateman's Vegas, where the locals and the tourists were in constant tension and there was a lot of worry about the ecology of the space and what that would mean as it kept changing. We made a series of small games about little parts of the system that all fed into each other, that were connected by a story, and as people played the games, different outcomes would, would happen. It was terrible. We threw it out um, after we showed it once, but we learned a whole lot from it. And from there, we figured we could start to work on an actual thing. We looked at a bunch of different settings again, but we ended up deciding that we needed something fun. We could talk about anything as a system, it turned out. So we wanted something that people would have an instant buy into, they might already be familiar with, so we don't have to do a lot of work, and maybe something that already has a story. And so, we've got a slide, we decided on a music festival. A music festival is something that a lot of people are familiar with, it has inbuilt narrative, it is a huge space with thousands of people, it is a structure that is built and then disappears over the course of maybe a few weeks, it has a very strong connection to the ecology of its own space, a whole lot of social interactions and capacity for terrible things to happen. Um, and we liked that a lot. It also meant that we could have Dolly Parton in a show and that was good. So we went away and we did our big systems map of a music festival, it's just a sort of generic music festival. We came up with different storylines, different parts of the system that might be represented by different game mechanics and found ways to kind of string them together into a story. And we made a show called Best Festival Ever, which happens around a table for about 30 people or so. Um, and the audience 
sit down and play the managers of a music festival. They book the artists, they lay out the festival, they drive the rubbish around, they get Dolly Parton to the concert on time. At a certain point, the uh, dam upriver bursts and there is a flood and they pivot very quickly to evacuating tens of thousands of people. This was a really fun game to make. We made a lot of discoveries in it and it was sort of in development for about three years on and off um, with several different iterations, but it's become something that we've since done in about half a, dozen, do, half a dozen different countries around the world. We've done it in schools, in universities, theatres, conference rooms. We've got it into companies where there were no conversations about climate and we put a climate play in front of them. It says climate once in the script, but everything about this play is about how people can model systems to understand them better, to manage them better, and to predict their behavior in the future. Um, that was a really foundational game for us, and it has informed a lot of our process since then. Um, and yeah, best festival ever. It's also a lot of fun, because you get to drop Dolly Parton on her head if no one catches her. I did not look at the time, Kathy, when I started. Do you want to just like tell me when I'm... Uh, so, a couple of years after that, we started working with an NGO in Sweden called Miljöverkstan, which is a nature workshop. They're a community group that works with locals and new migrants to connect them with nature and help them build community connections. They wanted us to make a game about an area... There's not meant to be this much black. Hey, look at this. Uh, an area called Flarten, which is a nature reserve and a lake south of Stockholm. It's this gorgeous old oak forest, pristine water. It's filled with um, endangered species. It also has a lot of really strong social use. Um, People walk their dogs, swim in summer. There are low-income workers that um, are in caravans there, and there's a Romani camp that's been there for several decades. At the time that we were starting this project, there was also a lot of pressure to build housing there. Sweden had just taken on half a million migrants um, and refugees from Syria, and you cannot be homeless in Sweden because you would freeze in winter. So some, everyone needed to live somewhere. There were a lot of conversations about what is the value of these green spaces, and can they be put to better use? Um, this was quite different from making a game about a music festival because this is a real world location with real people, a lot of communities that we didn't have direct access for consultation to, but we needed to still try and create an entire picture. So we made a game called Democratic Nature, um, which is a game where you look at different parts and different domains of this social ecological system. You look at birds and beetles, you look at people that visit on the weekend or have been there for generations, and how all those parts link together. The game starts 10,000 years ago as the, first, as the ice sheets sort of melt away from Sweden and people fill the space, um, and it goes right up to today. And in jumping between all these different domains, people, players are kind of getting a, an understanding of the linkages of the space and the different ways that we can measure value. The second half of the game is everybody coming up with a future that they would like for the area and then playing a series of really chaotic games that kind of mimic Sweden's complicated uh, planning process to uh, try and achieve that vision and usually end up somewhere quite different. Um, but this was then a game that stayed in a space in Flarten um, that all different groups would come and play, led by Milia Verkstan. We had locals, um, council members and new migrants all playing at the same time and then having a conversation after the game about the future. A big thing that we've sort of learnt and best festival ever was a huge part of it was that these games are a really good conversation starter. They can give people a common experience, they can give people a language and a toolkit to think through things and a sort of common touchstone that you can then have a conversation. Often we'll have an expert come in and people that have never engaged with that kind of science are able to sort of talk and ask questions of an expert, a scientist, a researcher, in a way that they wouldn't be able to before because the kind of dynamics and relationships that the scientist works with have been represented in these little games. Just by driving trucks around your music festival, you start to get a better understanding of feedback loops. And so you can talk to a fire scientist a bit better about bushfires. Um, so that was democratic nature. That's still democratic nature. I had a lot more slides than this, uh, than I thought I had for this, I guess. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so we finished that in about 2016 in Sweden. It was very cold. We were working in a repurposed um, bathers pavilion next to the lake in winter, and the generator stopped working. In um, 20. 20, we started working with the Lowitcher Institute, which is an uh, Australian health research body that funds and trains um, researchers in doing health research projects with Indigenous communities, particularly going out into remote communities, conducting research for uh, their own health projects. Uh, the Lowitcher Institute had a bunch of training resources that they felt people weren't engaging with at all, so they wanted to see if we could make something that was a little bit more hands-on and give people something of a sandbox environment where there could be mistakes made and it's not creating any sort of horrible ethical disasters or things like that. So we worked with Lowitcher Institute staff for quite a while and we had some incredible conversations um, with people from community, people who've worked in community. It was a real honor and privilege to get to have those conversations and do that learning. And something that came out of a lot of it was the sort of realization that I think we'd been thinking about for a little while, but it really came to the front that a lot of game mechanics, particularly board game mechanics, but I think um, all game mechanics are deeply rooted in colonialism. They're about occupying space, they're about getting points and winning, discovering things, all that sort of thing. That was not going to work for this project at all. So we had to really rethink the way that we framed and designed our games and the sort of way we talked about objectives when it comes to like managing a system that's represented in the game. We made a series of games for this project, um, which we called Week in the Bush. We drew a lot from storytelling games and role-playing games and made a series of games that uh, some of them are just a deck of card prompts where players will draw a map and tell a story about an entirely new research project and sort of come together to figure out ways that they adapt to challenges and, and changes along the way. Um, one of the games is about planning a research project with blocks, but then needing to constantly update it as new information comes to light and you make new connections. Uh, one game is about, not that's the map one. <laughs> Uh, one game is about, uh, it's this almost choose your own adventure story where you are building bonds with a community and those bonds let you see past the symptoms of the problem in the community to find the actual problems so that you can actually start having a conversation about how to improve things. A big dynamic of those games and of Lowich's work is making sure that when there is a research project happening in a community, not only is the community protected in that process, but the community needs to benefit from it as well. That there should be some sense of an exchange. If people are giving their lived experience and their knowledge, that, that it can't be a one-way transaction. Um, and so we tried to capture that in those games through storytelling mechanics. And the nice thing about that and a lot of the ideas that were in those materials and those conversations, that they all came back to our systems thinking stuff as well. Ideas about not being able to observe a system without being part of it. And the idea that you're, the relationships you form for a project exist past the bounds of that project. Um, there were some incredible case studies of like a, a researcher going out into a remote community to do some health research and taking a handy worker with them who would just fix up people's kitchens while they were doing work. There was another story about researchers who stayed in touch with the community and decades later were still helping the community get grant funding for projects and activate other community projects and things like that. Really beautiful community ideas that have clear systems parallels and there are also things that I think we all took into our sort of personal practice as well in a really lovely way. That was a really beautiful project and it was a real honor to get to work on that. Um, how am I going for time, Kathy? Almost done. Great. That's good. I'm going to very quickly uh, talk specifically about a particular game and the decisions we made because that might be useful to hear. Busy Mares was a game we made in Singapore with the Earth Observatory Singapore um, who asked us to make a bunch of games about natural disasters, particularly typhoons and volcanoes, and really interested in the point between finding out that a disaster might occur 
and the disaster occurring itself. Not so much when it happens or afterwards, the cleanup was a separate thing, but they were really interested in that sort of decision-making window where you have some but not all information and you have some time to react. Singapore doesn't get many typhoons and has no volcanoes, but they're a really active player in the region in terms of how they prepare, like help other nations prepare and adapt and respond. So we made a series of games that now live at the Singapore Science Center about this little window of time. We were really interested in this particular trade-off, um, which is basically as time goes on, the certainty of the forecast and your certainty of what's going to happen increases. But as that happens, your ability to act, make decisions and reduce casualties decreases. At the start, you have no information, but you could do anything by the time that you know exactly what's going to happen, it's too late. And that's a really clear trade-off that has strong links straight into game mechanics and narrative stories as well. So we started playing around with different things and we came upon the idea of a election cycle, a really busy week, it's the last week of a campaign. And so we have in this game, there are three teams and a storm is going to hit one of their towns, they're all in an election and they basically just have to decide what of their campaign to sacrifice to prepare for a storm that may or may not hit them. It's just a big sort of decision-making conversation game where everyone will sit around a table and stress out because there are no good options. But it's a lot of fun. And a campaign election also gives us a lot of room to play with story and that's, again, as artists with a theatre background, that's kind of a lot of fun for us. So we made this game Busy Mares. Um, the storm moves or doesn't move every round and people just make decisions. But it was a very clear link for us from that trade-off to what is a mechanic that works, and we're like, oh, maybe replacing things on a schedule. If you've got limited spaces, you need to either have as much election prep done or as much evacuation prep done. And then what's a narrative for that? Well, we can do the same thing, and it's really easy to build a story that escalates in intensity over time. Um, and yeah, that's it, I think. <laughs> Mildly chaotic, but um, I think just like as a closing thing, reflecting on those projects over the last 10 years that I've been doing this as part of Boho Interactive, I think the thing that has changed the most is over time we've tried to give more and more agency over telling the stories and over making decisions to the players. And more and more we've tried to just create a framework that lets that happen for people. There's a lovely quote that would have been a brilliant slide <laughs> that is by Polo Pettuccini that says, if you want to understand systems, don't play games, make games. And we don't have time to let every audience make a game, but we try and uh, let some of that come in and give agency and create, you know, and, and make the play part of creation. Um, yeah, an inauspicious end.